We have uh, a real pleasure, and I might say a real privilege, uh, before us. One of the best military and naval historians of our generation, and perhaps the best diplomatic uh, historian of World War II, Andrew Roberts, is going to make a presentation on those elements of the Second World War, and uh, you will be fascinated by what he has uh, to say. Uh, Andrew is a graduate of the University of Cambridge. He has written four or five major books uh, about the Second World War, famously uh, The Storm of War. But my personal favorite, uh, a book called Masters and Commanders, is about the creation of and the operations subsequent to their creation of the combined chiefs of staff, the American Joint Chiefs and the British uh, Joint Chiefs, the British Combined Chiefs uh, as they came together, uh, who were the architects of uh, policy uh, all during the Second World War. It's a study, it seems to me, should be part of the education uh, of every American military or naval uh, officer. So with that, I give you... Uh, my old friend and colleague, Andrew Roberts. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great honor to be invited to address you, especially, of course, at the time of the um, Remembrance Month of, uh, of November. We've had here in the United Kingdom, Her Majesty the Queen attend a uh, service solely uh, on her own at Westminster Abbey due to COVID to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the first of the uh, unknown soldier, the, the day on which the unknown soldier was uh, was buried at Westminster Abbey. And uh, of course, nonetheless, a, a large plethora of other um, meetings. And uh, so to be able to address you um, now is a, a, an, added, uh, an added bonus for me. I'd also like to thank Cy Bunting, a great friend of many years, um, it's a little nerve-wracking, actually, to be talking about this subject, which is about uh, Allied cooperation and the creation of grand strategy between Pearl Harbor and um, and victory in Japan. Um, because, of course, Sai is writing the biography of uh, General George Marshall, who's an absolutely key figure in uh, all of that. And so uh, I hope he's going to be agreeing with what I say. I'd like to start, if I may, with the um, speech that was given by Field Marshal Sir Alan Brooke, later Lord Alan Brooke, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, so the man in charge of the British Army during the Second World War. He uh, took over in that position in December 1941, and he became Chief of the, um, of the British Chiefs of Staff, to Chairman of it, in the March of 1942. And so he was a key figure um, in all of this, as uh, you'll, um, as I'll come to uh, to explain later. But he said this in a speech after the war, and um, of course it's referring to British policy. But I think it has an interesting series of overtones for um, for the whole alliance. He said this in 1942, before the Battle of El Alamein. Rommel was at the gates of Cairo. German forces were through the Caucasus. Japanese forces were threatening Australia and India. The Mediterranean was closed, and Persia had been entirely depleted of forces saved um, for threatened points. The whole of the oil reserves in the Middle East, in Iraq and Persia, were at Hitler's mercy. <coughs> Excuse me. This loss would have been irreparable as the shortage of tankers due to submarine action made it impossible to supply our wants from the Western Hemisphere, and the Burma and Dutch East, oil, uh, East India oil were lost to Japan. We should have been faced with crippling paralysis on land, at sea, and in the air, throughout the Middle East and India. The road would have been open for Germany and Japan to join hands with all the dire results that would have ensued. It's well that we should avoid unwarranted complacency and remind ourselves that if we did win the last war, it was not without moments of extreme peril. And so what I'd like to talk to you about really is how we got from that uh, position to the position only two and a half years later when Germany was at, um, 
uh, was on their knees. Uh, the Nazis were about to uh, surrender. And uh, from the, from the uh, point that he was talking about, which was, uh, as I say, the autumn of uh, the fall of 1942, um, and, uh, and, uh, and the whole world, um, whole allied forces were going to be able to concentrate solely on Japan. And I think one of the key um, moments, really, one of the key uh, decisions was that taken by the Roosevelt administration earlier, before America entered the war, um, which was, of course, the great Germany first decision. Um, even though you, uh, Americans, had been attacked uh, at Pearl Harbor in the Pacific, you had um, your, your press and your public and your Congress were quite understandably demanding um, that that, uh, that monstrous and uh, completely, um, well, in FDR's words, infamous uh, attack should be punished a perfectly understandable and natural human response. Actually, what the Roosevelt administration did, um, in my view, in the greatest act of statesmanship of the 20th century, was to concentrate instead on Germany, to direct some 70% of all American resources to the uh, crushing of uh, Nazi Germany, even though you had not been attacked by Nazi Germany in any way and had been, of course, by the Japanese on the other side of your continent. Um, it was an extraordinary decision in many ways, uh, politically a counterintuitive decision, but the right decision on the Clausewitzian, the classic Clausewitzian um, precept that you uh, take on your uh, strongest enemy first. And uh, only once uh, the Nazis had been defeated um, did you uh, did you then move on to uh, to force Japan to surrender uh, in the sur September of 1945. It was a it was a gigantic um, decision to have made and a great one. And um, the person who I mentioned earlier, General George C. Marshall, was uh, was key in this. Um, he became U.S. Army Chief of Staff. This uh, this courtly Pennsylvanian, uh, in, on the 1st of September 1939, um, in one of those extraordinary coincidences of history, of, the, of which there are so many that they can't really any longer be considered coincidences, uh, we see that he became U.S. Army Chief of Staff on the same day that Adolf Hitler unleashed his blitzkrieg on Poland. And so he's one uh, of the four um, great figures that I want to talk about today and the way in which they interacted to create the uh, Western policy, the Western grand strategy, the um, decisions about which countries were going to be invaded, when and under what circumstances. Um, as well as being a courtly Pennsylvanian um, uh, who had studied, of course, at um, the um, VMI, he was also uh, what Churchill called the Carno of victory, the organizer of victory after Lazar Carno. Uh, Napoleon's great uh, general who had, uh, who had organized uh, so many of the Napoleonic war victories and indeed the Revolutionary War victories before that. Um, he had the kind of brain that any CEO would love to uh, have today, General Marshall. He was able to turn an American army uh, that was only the 16th largest army in the world when the Second World War broke out in September 1939, um, of uh, only 200,000. You, you had an army the same size as Romania or Portugal. And he turned that into a fully uh, orchestrated and uh, equipped and uniformed and trained armed force, um, if you uh, take into account also the Navy and the Air Force, of some 16 million American uh, men and women in uniform by September 1945. That is an 80 um, times the size of the army uh, at the beginning of the war, an extraordinary achievement, and one that um, must be uh, credited amongst many other people, but nonetheless primarily to uh, General George C. Marshall. Next person is the man I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Field Marshal Lord Alan Brooke. Uh, he was a tough um, Ulsterman. He would sit sitting opposite um, the uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill down in the uh, cabinet war rooms, breaking pencils in half, uh, saying, no, I disagree with you, Prime Minister. 
Um, he uh, he had a, a fairly low, indeed very low, opinion of Winston Churchill's strategic capacity. He had, um, like Churchill, been educated uh, in the military academy of Sandhurst. Uh, his his brother had fought in the Gallipoli campaign in 1915, which is, I think, one of the reasons that he had such a low um, view of Churchill's capacities. And he was not going to be browbeaten by the Prime Minister. They would have uh, they would have shouting rows over the creation of grand strategy. The third person, of course, is FDR, somebody who, although he had not been educated at VMI or Sandhurst or any other military academy, nonetheless very much felt that he had the, um, the knowledge and the understanding of grand strategy. He'd, of course, been the undersecretary for the Navy in the First World War. He'd read a lot of Alfred Thayer Mann, um, and was uh, was therefore, as far as he was concerned, uh, easily well up enough. And you have these four people, Winston Churchill being the other one, who was um, uh, very much in control of his own hinterland, like Marshall and um, FDR, who dominated his own administration, Marshall, who dominated the US uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, even though he had sitting on that uh, that body uh, the redoubtable uh, Admiral Ernest J. King, uh, the U.S. Arm, uh, Navy Chief of Staff, an extraordinary uh, figure, again, as tough as nails. Um, and, uh, and Brooke was very much in control of the Chiefs of Staff as well. Um, Winston Churchill also dominated his cabinet. Um, he, would, he didn't mind being, um, uh, being outvoted on things that had nothing to do with the war, like the... Um, level of the Indian rupee, but he would not um, ever accept uh, being um, overturned on a strategic decision. So you have these four men, each of them, as I say, in control of their, of their hinterland, um, and each knowing, or at least believing that they knew, how to um, win the war, the best strategy to adopt. And what you see, therefore, from the moment of the American entry into the war in uh, December 1941, all the way through to victory, is a complicated minuet uh, that, that is danced by these four um, people, because each knew that if they uh, managed to get at least two of the others on the side, then their concept of grand strategy would be adopted. And they were tough um, arguments. They were harsh debates that went on in the combined chiefs of staff. You have... Um, moments of uh, where Marshall would slam his uh, fist down on the table um, and would uh, have shouting matches with um, with General Brooke. Um, we were very fortunate that Field Marshal um, Sir Jack Dill was um, over in Washington as the liaison uh, for the Combined Chiefs of Staff because he was somebody who who um, Marshall liked and admired and was able to be the sort of oil between the wheels sometimes um, when it was necessary between Brooke and Marshall. Marshall's relationship with uh, FDR was also a tremendously important one. Um, FDR wanted to try, he enjoyed having lackeys. He liked to draw people into the vortex of his, uh, of his leadership, of his tremendous charm and, uh, and uh, capacity. Um, but uh, Marshall made it very clear very early on that he was, even before he actually became U.S. Army Chief of Staff, that he was not going to allow that to happen. And when he was um, told by the president that he could, uh, he could call him uh, Franklin, he replied, I'll call you Mr. President, Mr. President, and I'd like you to call me General. And uh, he was therefore not going to be sucked into this vortex of, uh, of henchmen that uh, sometimes FDR liked to have around him. The relationship, as I mentioned, between, um, between Churchill and uh, Brooke was a, was a um, um, no-holds-barred one. We see that from Brooke's quite extraordinary uh, daily diary that he, uh, that he kept, which I do recommend. I'm sure that most of you will have already looked at it or read it. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary document of uh, the way in which a um, a top soldier has to deal with a politician who is um, convinced that he knows more about fighting than anybody else. And Winston Churchill, of course, had fought 
on five um, in five campaigns on four continents prior to the Second World War, and uh, and very much felt that he he'd been in the uh, British Army on and off years, and he very much felt that he could uh, could uh, work out which admirals and generals were best and um, which ones were there to be uh, hired and fired and supported and uh, and undermined. Um, and this hiring and firing aspect is a tremendously important one for all four people. Um, Marshall, of course, was responsible for sacking no fewer than 60 generals during the um, Second World War. He would not put up with, um, with people who were too slow, who were too, as far as he was concerned, old for the job. Um, he would sack ones who, especially in North Africa, uh, had not performed and uh, it was a, um, uh, he was a good butcher, frankly, of, uh, of people's careers, something that he recognized was an absolutely essential pre prerequisite for leadership. And so some of these meetings, as I mentioned, could get, uh, could get pretty tough. There's one that happens in the, uh, um, not only people breaking in pencils in half and shouting and, and slamming their fists down and, uh, and so on, but... Um, there's one moment where the anglophobic um, General Alfred, uh, sorry, Albert Wedemeyer uh, said that he wanted to sock, uh, sock Brook in the jaw uh, during a, uh, a Chiefs of Staff meeting. Um, and what people, uh, what in particular Marshall and Brook would do under these circumstances is to clear the room. This happened in the uh, Chateau Frontenac in the Quebec conference. You can still go there today. The Salon um, Rosé is exactly the same as it was uh, back in uh, 1943 when they were having the um, conference there, the Sextant Conference. And they would clear the room and take out all of the um, vice chiefs and the deputy chiefs and uh, the administrative officials and so on and just have solely the chiefs of staff sitting around the table. Um, there's a, uh, a wonderful story about how um, they had uh, they had got to the end of the meeting and then Lord Mountbatten um, brought in, the head of uh, combined operations, brought in two enormous blocks of ice to demonstrate how they were going to try to lasso a iceberg from the Arctic and bring it down to uh, the coast of Normandy and use it as a giant unsinkable aircraft carrier for the D-Day operation. Um, and they were going to make it, they thought, unsinkable by, uh, by making it with wood pulp. And uh, the creator of this uh, had um, said that it was, uh, it was definitely going to work. And in order to prove this, um, one of the blocks of ice uh, was shot at by Lord Mountbatten with his um, revolver, and it disintegrated immediately showing that the Luftwaffe could, if it uh, dropped a bomb on the, um, uh, on the iceberg, just destroy it. However, with uh, the wood pulp over the top of it, um, it was supposedly indestructible. And what Lord Mountbatten did was to, uh, to fire at the, in the Salon um, Rosé, uh, to fire into this, uh, this block of wood pulp ice. And in the words of the diary of... Um, of uh, Lord Mount uh, of um, uh, General Brook, the bullet um, buzzed around the room like an angry bee. Uh, the ricochet uh, capacity was explained in a in a room full of chiefs of staff, and somebody from outside who'd had to leave the meeting earlier. Uh, one of the um, one of the younger assistants said, "Oh my God, they're shooting at each other now." That was the level at which some of these meetings uh, managed to go awry. And of course they did, because the decisions that they were taking uh, had a direct relevance on the lives or possible deaths of tens of thousands of people. There's a British historian um, called Ronald Lewin who said that there is no rule of war that says that men must die in battle, but that staff officers cannot be vexed. Um, and, uh, and they were vexed very often. But ultimately, they remembered, all of them remembered, that the most important thing was, of course, to create a Western grand strategy, grand strategy that defeated the Nazis, and ultimately the Nazis and the Japanese 
and uh, the Italians were the enemy rather than each other. And they always managed to keep that in the forefront of their minds. I'm only going to be talking about the creation of Western uh, grand strategy. You know, of course, that um, ultimately it was, um, it was the war in the East that uh, destroyed the uh, Wehrmacht. Um, one of the most important statistics of the Second World War for me is that for every five Germans killed in combat, in um, in the Second World War, German soldiers, I mean, uh, rather than being bombed in the combined bomber offensive, but I mean, uh, actually on the battlefield, for every five of them, four died on the Eastern Front. So what um, you, the Americans, and we, the British, and the Canadians, and so on, were, were doing was killing the fifth German. Um, the essential thing was to make sure that, uh, that Stalin stayed in the war and that the Russians uh, killed the other four. When it came to the, um, to the use of charisma, which was, uh, which was used by FDR and Winston Churchill a great deal in, uh, in calming down these circumstances, great use of humor by, uh, by Churchill, um, it, was, uh, it was invaluable. This was part of the, the kind of leadership. There was also a, a sort of gentlemanly... Uh, capacity for uh, interaction, intellectual interaction that was um, that was quickly established early on in the war between the Western and the leadership of the Western Allies, and something which was a mile away uh, from what was happening over in the Wolfschanze, where Adolf Hitler would listen to his generals, almost all of whom had a better strategic sense than he. Um, they had all gone to Staff College, of course, in the 1920s when he had um, been a um, street rabble rouser. He'd never got uh, above the rank of corporal in the First World War. And so he would listen to men like, um, like Rundstedt, Gerd von Rundstedt or Eric uh, Manstein, um, Erwin Rommel, um, these, uh, these major uh, figures with, um, with extremely impressive um, uh, brains and would uh, listen to them sometimes for up to an hour uh, in the meetings, and we know this because uh, the after he closed the Reichstag um, <clears throat> and it was burnt in 1934, he used the stenographers to take down everything that was being said in the um, in the Führer conferences. And so Heinz Guderian, for example, would give a uh, an hour's um, speech. On, uh, on what needed to be done. And uh, Hitler would listen to him uh, patiently. Um, it's not true that he used to butt in all the time. He didn't. He would listen. And uh, then right at the end of the meeting, he would decide to do exactly what he'd originally intended to do at the beginning. He didn't get the kind of um, open and honest um, interaction as you did in the, uh, in the combined chiefs of staff. And what, very interestingly, Stalin was doing in the Second World War was to move from the um, Hitlerian, the dictatorial totalitarian way of interacting with, um, with generals and, uh, and move much more towards the collegiate side, uh, so long, of course, as no politics was involved and his complete control over the Soviet Union wasn't in any way questioned. So, he would listen and interact and give a great deal of autonomy to marshals such as um, Georgi Zhukov and Rokozovsky and Ivan Konyev and the other um, senior figures. So he was moving from the Hitlerian towards the Western uh, way of, um, of making decisions. So what was the most important decision that the Western uh, allies had to make? Clearly, it was the after it had already been decided by the Roosevelt administration to uh, concentrate on Germany first. It was after that the uh, timing of the cross-channel attack at, uh, at Over Operation Overlord, which eventually, of course, took place on the 6th of June 1944. It was at one stage going to uh, be on the 1st of May 1944, but it had to be put back um, because of the lack of landing crafts by uh, five weeks, and then an extra day, of course, because of the bad weather. But that date came as the result 
of two years, longer than two years, of extremely tough negotiation between um, the Americans and the British and between the masters, the political masters, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill, and the um, military commanders, um, Brooke and Marshall. And the interaction between them is a fascinating one and is the result, what, what ultimately turned out to be the result uh, was uh, was June 1944, because at the beginning, um, having seen the British army and the French army, much of it, um, forced off the continent at Dunkirk in May and June 1940, um, Brooke and Churchill were not willing to return to the continent until they could be absolutely certain that they were going to be able to protect the beach, beachhead and to uh, secure the um, the position on the continent once they had got it. They weren't going to go back until, therefore, um, air superiority was established, which didn't happen until the April of 1944, once the P-51 Mustang had uh, cleared the Messerschmitts from the skies over Normandy. Um, the other great delaying um, problem was that in January 1942, the Germans added a fourth rotor to the machine, the Enigma machine that created the uh, ultra decrypts when the boffins and the, the professors at Bletchley Park uh, managed to break into the, into the code, then they were suddenly cut out of it in June uh, 1942. And you can see on the graphs of the shipping uh, losses how that went straight up um, the moment that they were not able to pinpoint the wolf packs um, and where they were in the Atlantic. Uh, and it wasn't until December of 1942 that they were able to break back into the shark code, as it was called. Um, then by August 1943, um, the Battle of the Atlantic was, uh, was, was won. And that meant that the amount of shipping that could cross the Atlantic and be used um, in the invasion was going to be at the sufficient level because it was an extraordinary amount of equipment that was needed. A fully armoured um, division, a, a proper um, tank division, uh, needed 1,600 tonnes of, um, of supplies per day, be it ammunition or, or fuel or, um, or uh, different kinds of supplies, food and so on. 1,600 per day. So imagine how much needed to be brought over, most of it from America and Canada, uh, before the uh, cross-channel attack could take place. Um, there were other things like the invention of the Pluto, the pipeline under the ocean, which brought fuel from, uh, from the Isle of Wight in southern England over to Normandy. Um, the Mulberry Harbours, of course, these extraordinary 60-storey high uh, buildings, cement uh, and concrete that were, that were shipped over and sunk uh, off the uh, coast of Normandy. These inventions, um, uh, most of them were not ready until 1944. And so the great struggles, the great battles between Lord Marshall on one side and, um, and Churchill, Roosevelt and Brooke on the other really came to a head at the Washington Conference in uh, June 1943, which was the moment at which they decided they were going to go for that, um, that May 1944 date. Uh, by that stage, the, um, the key figure in the, uh, the decision-making process, Franklin Roosevelt, had changed sides. And it was, he, he'd understood time-wise that, uh, that it, was, it was time to, uh, to cross the channel the following May. Um, which had to, of course, be put back until June. And this was a, um, uh, an extraordinary decision and, and a brilliant one because it was timed uh, superbly. Of course, D-Day could have gone wrong, um, but by that time, by June 1944, um, the Allies were ready to undertake that extraordinary crossing. Um, much earlier, and, I'm, and there's a very good chance that it might have not have succeeded, and had it failed, it would have pushed back the uh, victory in the West, uh, possibly, well, certainly one year, uh, maybe longer, and that, of course, would have been absolutely catastrophic 
um, because on the Eastern Front in July 1944, the Red Army killed, wounded, or captured no fewer than 510,000 Germans. And uh, there would have been nothing to have stopped the Red Army from, uh, from crossing, sweeping across Germany. Uh, they could have got to Paris. Indeed, when uh, Stalin went to Potsdam and uh, visited the tomb of, um, of Frederick the Great in uh, Potsdam in 1945, um, and people congratulated him on the way in which the Red Army had captured Moscow. Um, he turned to one of his marshals and shrugged and said, that's nothing. Tsar Alexander I got to Paris. So ultimately, um, you have this, uh, this great debate, these great uh, struggles, um, but it is FDR's movement from the camp of Churchill and Brooke over to um, Marshall that decides that the uh, attack, the cross-channel attack is going to take place. And of course, it takes place the very day after Rome falls um, in, the, uh, in the Italian campaign. Um, the, the reason that the British could no longer um, put up a, um, an opposition to this, uh, to this date of May was partly, uh, and this is a very hard-fought historical um, debate, but uh, partly uh, because by that stage they too recognised that it had to happen uh, for these political reasons that I mentioned also um, because they had got um, the, uh, the victory over the um, Germans on, in the sea and in the air, but also because the sheer productive capacity of the United States meant that ultimately the decision uh, was going to be an American one. It had to be led by an American. Brooke himself wanted to lead it. Uh, so did Marshall at one point, but the decision was taken that it had to be Eisenhower because uh, FDR told Marshall that he couldn't do without him in Washington. Um, and he uh, and Marshall um, uh, accepted that, even though he could have, uh, have um, rebelled against it if he had wanted to. He was too much, as I say, of a, uh, of a giant and a gentleman to, to do that. Um, and the other great statistic, it strikes me, of the Second World War is the productive capacity of the United States. Because in the calendar year 1944, when the Germans produced 40,000 warplanes, the British 20,000, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the whole of um, the... Um, productive capacity of America produced no fewer than 98,000 warplanes. It was almost as much as the whole of the rest of the world uh, put together. And, uh, and this shows uh, quite what, um, what America was able to insist upon when it came to the timing of uh, D-Day. And it was very fortunate, as I say, that, uh, that they did. Because of the um, because the, the the timing was right, um, one thing that you can be uh, <laughs> my 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 don at Cambridge, my uh, my professor Norman Stone uh, told me that there's nothing inevitable. One should, as an historian, never say anything is inevitable in history because nothing is inevitable in history except for German counterattack. Um, that is always inevitable, and you see that, of course. Uh, tremendously after, just as you'd seen it before D-Day at uh, Anzio and uh, Salerno and uh, any number of times in North Africa, of course, um, you were, uh, and indeed on the Eastern Front constantly, um, you see that in the West after, uh, after D-Day, primarily, of course, with that extraordinary attack in the uh, Ardennes um, that the Americans call the uh, Battle of the Bulge. It's uh, it's an incredible feat in many ways. Thirty-nine divisions um, unleashed through uh, through feet of snow, um, with the searchlights beamed against the clouds, turning uh, turning night into day. All the messages handed by hand um, uh, by motorbike, rather than being um, beamed, so that they couldn't be intercepted by the Allies. Uh, an extraordinary counterattack, but one that uh, that the Americans and to a lesser degree the British also were able to um, to contain. So it shows the um, the 
there's extraordinary capacity for the Germans to counterattack, which always has to be borne in mind when you're undertaking something as complicated as an amphibious assault across 25 miles of uh, seawater like, uh, like D-Day was. There's a, um, another uh, quotation by uh, an American uh, historian called uh, Greenfield, Greenfeld, who said that whose strategy will be the sounder will never be known. It will be the su subject of controversy as long as the strategy of World War II is debated. Personally, as an historian, I'm very pleased about that, needless to say, um, because the more people who, uh, who debate uh, the strategy, uh, the happier I am. But in a sense, it's a bit of a false dichotomy, because overall, um, Churchill and Brooke were right to have opposed Overlord before June 1944, and FDR and, um, and Marshall were right to have insisted on it at that time. Democracies, as I say, are better than um, totalitarian dictatorships, which, although they know when the war is going to break out, the totalitarians, uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the way of, of coming to agreements, this interaction, this intellectual uh, capacity to, uh, to argue as gentlemen, sometimes losing tempers, but 95% but, uh, of the time not, um, uh, the way in which the political masters democratically elected, and the military commanders interacted it was absolutely central and far superior to the decision-making process that was going on 1,800 miles behind the front in uh, East Prussia, uh, where the Fuhrer, as I say, uh, tended to do what um, he originally thought he was going to do under all circumstances. And so you have also these, these four men who had, um, by 1945, had been through years of, uh, of exhausting uh, conflict, who had, all of them, lost friends, who had uh, been, um, been through the mill in ways that none of us, uh, perhaps, could, um, uh, could ever know, with the fates of tens of thousands of, uh, of um, men and women and their, uh, hanging on their, their decision-making. And yet, um, although they occasionally had doubts, terrible doubts on occasion, uh, Winston Churchill feared that there would be, um, that the seas would be red, uh, the beaches of Normandy would be red with, uh, with the blood of the, um, of the uh, invasion force. Uh, nonetheless, and, and you also see this in the diaries of, um, of, uh, of Brooke, severe problems and, and worries about things that were going to go wrong. Everybody, you wouldn't be human unless you had these worries. Nonetheless, in all, the case of all four of them, and George Marshall confided to his wife sometimes how worried he was as well, but in public, in public, um, when it came to, uh, to the Congress or it came to the press or it came to um, the, uh, the, their own um, staffs, each of these four men, um, they, uh, they projected nothing but absolute certainty in a victorious outcome. And that, it strikes me, is the very quintessence of leadership. Thank you very much.